voting is way worse than doing nothing. Because voting says, I'm going to partake in this ritual, I'm going to play this game, and I understand and accept and project to the world that whoever wins this game has the right, the moral right, to violently dominate me and 300 million other people I don't even know. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. Today is the 7th of November, 2016, and today we are going to be talking to a special guest and someone that my longtime listeners will remember from previous appearances on this program, but new listeners might be seeing or hearing for the first time. That is Larkin Rose of LarkinRose.com, and he has written many things and produced many videos that are must-see, but... Suffice it to say, if you have not read The Most Dangerous Superstition, you are an ill-informed person and you should feel bad about yourself. And I feel bad about myself for not having a physical copy of that book. I only have an electronic edition, so I can't even show it to you, but I'll, I'll get the editor to place it on the screen for us at this point so that people can see it. And yes, please do get it in whatever form you can and read it and digest it and understand it. And if you do so, you probably won't even need to watch the rest of this conversation. But in order to sell it, let's uh, let's talk to Larkin about uh, some of the ideas contained in that book and some of the other writings he's done. Larkin, thank you for joining us on the program today. Thanks for having me again. All right, Larkin, as you know, here I am in Japan, but I understand you in the United States. Um, I've just seen some headlines on Twitter or something. I don't really understand it, so maybe you can explain it to me. There's some sort of religious sacrament that's taking place in your country in a couple of days where people are going to go into some sort of booth and tick some sort of box and some deity is going to decide how the country will be run for the next four yeah, years? Yeah, it's this this strange cult ritual, and uh, it, it it the people involved seem to think it's not strange because they see everybody else involved, so they don't see it very objectively. Yeah, they basically go in, into this special building and go hide in a booth and do, I don't know what, incantations or things they do, and then they press a button and decide... Um, which deity, which they don't look like deities. They look like people. In fact, they don't look like nice people. Um, but I have it on good authority. If there is such a thing. Uh, that these are deities and they get to choose one to rule the world for uh, four years. And that that counts as being free. That's good enough. Right. Close enough to being free is to choose between two psychotic sociopaths um, to violently dominate everyone. And everybody's all excited. Now, now, come, come on, Larkin. They don't rule the world. They are the leaders of the free world. Get it straight. Um, yes, indeed. And this is an interesting sacrament, or whatever you want to call it. And be careful, everyone out there. If you take a selfie of your ballot after you've filled in the appropriate box, apparently you might be arrested, depending on what state you're in. So, you know, you got to be careful. The the gods have put a lot of rules in place for this particular sacrament, and it's to be taken very seriously. All right, um, clearly you and I are on the same side of this conversation, but I'm going to do my honest level best to put on the devil's advocate cap and actually attempt to put, uh, I, I think, a, a, a real argument in place against our flippant dismissal of election and voting. Selection, as I like to say, because it's, you know, but anyway. Um, and, and I think there is a legitimate concern that people out there have when they hear people saying, don't vote. Um, the, the, the concern is if candidate A embodies a set of policies we'll call policy package A, candidate B embodies a set of policy that we'll call policy package B, if you truly believe, whether or not that belief is true and justified, but if you truly believe policy package A will result in better material conditions for you and your family, at least over the next four years, then isn't that an argument to do at least that in the meantime, while you're working on other ways of trying to free yourself? No, and here's why not. Let's say policy, you know, collection of policies B is the one that somebody thinks is preferable. And A is the, oh, just intolerable and unspeakable. In that mindset, all the tyrants have to do to get people to vote for A, the worst one, is to make an even worse one. 
so that between the two, they vote for the worst one. I mean, the, the, the less bad one in their view. But in principle, that means they can trick you into advocating complete totalitarianism as long as they can offer another choice that's even slightly worse. And if you look at American politics, that's what it's been for 200 years. It's almost always, you know, that people complain about negative campaigning. Well, what else is there? All there is is your guy is even worse than my guy. And the reason it's such a, uh, a brilliant trick, well, it's not even brilliant. It's sad that people still fall for it. Uh, I used to use as a sort of extreme example, like uh, if they had Stalin running versus uh, Hitler, would you still vote? Would you still think it's legitimate? Would you still go, well, we definitely got to keep that out of power? Well, that stopped being a hypothetical when the candidates ended up being Hillary Stalin and Trump Hitler. It really is a national socialist against a communist. And people are on both sides are saying, well, the other one is just so horrible. I have to vote for this guy. And I use the flippant analogy, which is actually an understatement now. Two guys show up to your front door and say, hey, this is your lucky day. You know, this is important day for you. You get to choose. Either I'm going to punch you in the face or he's going to kick you in the crotch. You get to choose. So whichever one you choose, we will be representing you. We will be doing your will. You will have consented to it. Who would be dumb enough to choose one instead of just slamming the door in their face? And so it's democracy really is the best trick that tyrants have ever come up with because it gives enough of an illusion that the people have some say in the matter when they don't. Like the the system chooses the two puppets. You have nothing to do with that. And the only difference between here and, you know, Stalinist Russia is that the tyrants here are smart enough to say we have to at least give them two choices. So it looks like there's a choice. There's still not. But we have to like when you have one choice on the ballot, it's kind of hard to trick anybody with that. But if you put two authoritarian collectivists on the ballot, everybody rushes out to vote and endorse their own enslavement. And it's it's such a transparent trick. It's amazing. It still works, especially when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are the choices. Can it get more ridiculous than that? The the two most hated candidates or the least favorable candidates in, in since they started doing polling on sub- subjects. But there you go. That's the place that we've arrived at. Now, as a rather crude, but I think very appropriate Twitter meme I saw recently put it, uh, they had a picture of a red condom and a blue condom. You're going to get raped. Which which condom do you vote for? Um, I think is the, the idea that you're drawing out there. And I certainly agree with that. But again, let's be fair to people who say, who truly believe that candidate X, Y, or Z is not going to, is, is that is not a bad thing. We don't, I don't mind what this candidate wants to do. What is the underlying root principle of why it is immoral to actually cast a vote for one of these minions? If somebody was voting for somebody to enslave them and only them, I would just let them. I would laugh at them. I might even try to talk them out of it because that's insanely stupid. The problem is they're trying to appoint uh, appoint a ruler over, in this case, 300 million other people that they have no right to appoint a ruler over. And so the people, they're, they're sort of, they're the people who admit that they're just voting defensively. Like, I don't like either one, but I dislike that one more. But then there are, most Americans actually advocate government control and extortion and, and the violent domination of their fellow man by way of government. They want somebody in power to force their values on everybody else and to force everybody else to pay for the things that they want. Um, and that's just immoral. And again... It, it shows the brilliance of the trick of democracy where most people don't do that in their daily lives, go to their neighbors and say, you know, I really I think you should be forced to pay for like my kids schooling or maybe just free money for me because I'm not, I don't have a job right now or because, you know, whatever I think should exist that I don't want to pay for because that's too troublesome. Um, so I'm here with my gun and I'm going to make you pay for it. Most people don't do that because they know that's immoral and because it's risky, if nothing else. And yet, if they're taught to believe in democracy, they do exactly that by way of this, you know, elected psycho and a a gang of enforcers to go impose their will on people. So the belief in democracy makes us at war with each other, because then the question is, 
who is going to wield the cudgel of authoritarian power, not whether anyone should. Like, well, somebody's going to. I want it to be somebody who agrees with my values violently, you know, oppressing everybody else instead of somebody who believes in your values oppressing me. It makes everybody cheer for everybody to be enslaved except the ruling class. And most people don't even notice that that's that they're tricked into being at war with their neighbors and their family and friends. And it's called democracy. If this is freedom and this all the the complete bogus mythology they're taught. Democracy is war. It's who's going to violently control everybody for the next two years, four years, whether you're talking, you know, whatever office you're talking about. But it's always about who's going to violently impose their will on everybody else. And the only moral choice is nobody. I don't want anybody imposing my will on you. My only will is you be free and I be free. The end. And that's incompatible with government and democracy. But, they will say, isn't this like the, you know, it's all good in theory, it's all ideal, but say what you will, on Tuesday, tens of millions of people are going to go to a voting booth and do this. This is going to happen. So, you can talk about it, you can flap your gums, but it's going to happen, so... I'm going to go in there and try to get what I can out of this. I want, it, you know, we're on the plantation. Yeah, we got a slave master. Yeah, we got to get rid of them. But I want the best slave master for me in the meantime. Right. And there's a couple couple ways I'd respond to that. One is it's a little bit like saying, like, tomorrow the murder rate in this country is not going to be zero. There's going to be murder somewhere. So I'm going to go do it and kill somebody and steal his stuff because it's going to happen anyway. And my response is, you're the one doing it. Like, if you are the one, and, and I posted a thing on Facebook recently about this, and it was funny because not very many p people complained, and of those who did, none of them addressed the actual point, which is, if you vote for Hillary or you vote for Trump, and they get in, evil authoritarian stuff is going to happen. That is an absolute given. Government will keep being violent, you know, whether you're talking about the IRS, the ATF, the military, all the evil stuff. Too. It's going to keep doing evil stuff. Now, when that happens and you are one of the people who put them there, who intentionally went into that booth and pressed that button, knowing that meant I want this person to have this massive amount of power when he uses it to hurt other people, it's your freaking fault. And I can rest assured and rest comforted in the fact that I didn't help that happen. And if you want your excuse to be, well, yeah, sorry, you got your door kicked down and and, you know, you've got kidnapped at gunpoint or sorry, you got forcibly evicted from the country or sorry, you got shot by the cops or whatever. Uh, but, hey, it would have been even worse if I hadn't intentionally empowered that psychopath to rule over you. I would rather have nothing to do with it so it's not on my conscience that, oh, sorry about that. I didn't know he was going to do that to you. I know they're both going to do that to a lot of people, which is why never again will I support any evil in the name of, well, it's not quite as bad as the other evil. Like, tell that to the victims of government violence of whoever wins if you're the one, if you're one of the ones who voted for them and put them there. Like, if you voted for Hitler because I'm scared of the communists, well, guess what? You're the one who made this stuff happen. You helped empower that. And whoever wins, that's going to be true. And I'm not going to be one of the ones who empowers a psychopathic, violent parasite. Now, of course, now you have to prepare for the string, the never-ending string of counterfactuals that you're going to have to argue about over the next few years. Because, of course, when... Hillary gets in, or when Trump gets in, all of their supporters are going to argue about how much worse it would have been. And you put this, Scott, quite well in a little post you have up on your Facebook uh, page. It would be really, really handy, starting in a few months, to have two parallel universes, one in which supporters of Hillary might learn by example how idiotic it was to support her, and one in which supporters of Trump might learn by experience how idiotic it was to put him into power. 
But since we don't have that, here's what will happen instead. A narcissistic, authoritarian megalomaniac will get into power and use the violence of the state to do a bunch of evil crap. Those who supported that maniac will then say things would have been worse with the other one in power. While those who suppose, who supported the other maniac will say that this is the only, this only proves that they were right and that their candidate should have been elected. And then we'll do it all again in another four years because too many people are gullible and stupid. Or as H.L. Mencken uh, put it quite memorably, uh, the demagogue is one who preaches doctrines he knows to be untrue to men he knows to be idiots. <laughs> and that is the best indictment of the electoral system in general that I've ever seen, the most succinct one. But I think you're exactly right. We are going to have to put up with the, for the next four years with people convinced that they did the right thing by putting the lesser evil into power and people who are convinced that they did the right thing by not voting for that one, voting for the other evil. So <laughs> I don't know how right. you win an argument like that. I don't know what and you could this, possibly say. If this, if this was the first time around, like they just started this scam, it would be bad enough. Open a freaking history book. 200 years, more than 200 years of people voting for the lesser evil, freedom going downhill and authoritarian power going uphill the whole time. You can't vote for freedom. It doesn't ever work. And all, it, all you're arguing about is the rate at which we get to totalitarianism. And, and history shows that like you're not arguing whether we get there. Because if they just keep making the two choices worse and worse, you'll just keep piss picking the one that's not quite as bad as the next one. I've also pointed out the fact that, like, right now the the Republican Party, the conservative limited government party, is more collectivist authoritarian than the Democratic Party or any party was just a few decades ago. They just march along and sometimes they trade places of which authoritarian power they want. But as long as Tweedledee and Tweedledum keep getting the support of the people, they can both keep getting worse, and people just go, well, I have to vote for the less bad one. Notice the pattern of what's that what that has accomplished in the last 200 years. Pretty much totalitarianism. Like, we're not quite there yet, but we're, all, we're a, long, a long way closer than when democracy and elections started in this country. It's been downhill the whole time. And to think that, oh, this time if we vote really hard, somehow we're going to turn around and walk back 200 years. Just And that wasn't even freedom to begin with, but at least it was more than this, for some people anyway. And to expect, to expect voting to result in freedom with this much evidence, not just in this country, but around the world, it's ridiculous. And to keep falling for it. I, I really think – I'll quick throw this in. I know I'm babbling on and on. I really think that somewhere someone probably did a study and found out that four years is about the right amount of time so that people can forget what an atrocity it was to have the other party in power and get sick enough of the one they just elected so that they're forgetful enough that they go back to voting for the other one that made a disaster four years ago. And they just keep going back and forth between disasters. Like if they did it every other week, they'd say, well, we learned last week how horrible it was to have the Republicans in power. So let's not do that. But they just trade back and forth because people's memory is just, well, we can't have like they always talk in terms of, well, this is Hillary is completely intolerable. I'm not even going to look at what the option is and how horrible that is. All I know is we can't have this. And that's why power just bounces back and forth as they march down the road to, towards totalitarianism. Because it's always, whatever it is, I don't want what we have now. And that's the mentality. And all the tyrants have to do is put up two puppets, and you'll keep cheering for your own enslavement. Exactly. And it constantly keeps people reacting to whatever the establishment does. Okay, here's your two candidates this time. Now react in this way. You he Here's your two choices. Um, let, let me approach it from this way, because uh, like most people, I think who come into anarchism, it's usually from a, a set of libertarian principles that you think, okay, yes, okay, but not that far. I mean, I can't extend it all the way until you realize, oh, I kind of have to extend it all the way. And in that vein, I, I remember years ago, before I got into to the ideas of anarchism, I, I consciously realized that when you vote or when you support a candidate for doing X, Y, or Z, uh, you you are not just supporting that candidate in that time with that power. You are thereby 
really granting the idea that your worst enemy who will be voted in, you know, four years from now or eight years from now or whenever, that that horrible person that you can't stand will then have the legitimate right to use that same power that you your puppet, your preferred puppet has. I, I had that notion years and years ago, but it only strikes me now that that is the exact principle that your vote by voting for either one of these candidates under whatever circumstances is granting them the power, the ultimate power, the power of authority. And this is something that you, of course, have defined very clearly in, in The Most Dangerous Superstition. But for people who don't quite get what authority really means, how do you define it and what is it that you are granting someone by the, the act of voting for them? In short, authority is the right to rule, um, and there is no such thing, which is why I do the annoying thing all throughout my book of putting it in quotes. It's an imaginary thing. Uh, if I don't have the right to rule you, no amount of rituals or elections or no matter how many people want it can give me the right to rule you. They don't have the right to rule you. They couldn't have given it to me. That's true of every politician, every ruling class ever. But yeah, the 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 main underlying problem is legitimizing the system. When people go in and vote, they're basically saying, I agree that whoever gets more buttons pushed next to their name has basically the divine right of politicians. They have the right to rule. When they dominate us and call it law and taxation, it's bad for us to disobey. And it's good for them to forcibly hurt anybody who tries. And so to me, like statistically, your vote is meaningless, but the reason it's beyond um, doing nothing, because people say, well, you want to just do nothing? No, A, I don't want to do nothing, and B, voting is way worse than doing nothing. Because voting says, I'm going to partake in this ritual, I'm going to play this game, and I understand and accept and project to the world that whoever wins this game has the right, the moral right, to violently dominate me and 300 million other people I don't even know. And to legitimize, to play along, it's like the, the two psychos at your front door. You want to be punched in the face or kicked in the crotch. If you vote, you're saying, yep, I accept that as legitimate. That's okay. I'll go along with that. And, and you really are, in a sense, consenting to it. And so to vote is to consent to be somebody else's slave. Because if somebody else has the right to rule you and you have an obligation to obey and pay tribute to them by way of taxes, they basically own you. And to, and to argue over, well, I want a nicer owner, like that whole spectrum of possibilities is all pathetic and it's still slavery. If your goal is to have a nicer slave master owning you, you will never be free because you're not free inside your own head. You're not even trying for freedom. You're trying for a more pleasant version of slavery. And that's all democracy is. And it projects to the world that you think this is OK. And I'm never going to, again, project to the world that I think it's OK to appoint a violent parasite class to rob and control hundreds of millions of people I don't know. I wouldn't do it over myself, and I have no right to do it over anybody else. And so, yeah, the, legit, the apparent legitimacy, there's never legitimacy to government. It's all a game. It's all an illusion. But the apparent legitimacy comes from voting. And that's why I say it's the best trick the tyrants have ever come up with. Because if the tyrants just come along and say, hey, we have a bunch of guys with guns, you're going to do what we want or we're going to hurt you. There, in this case, there'd be 100 million gun owners who are saying, no, you won't, because we have more guns than you and we don't accept your legitimacy. But if two puppets come along and say, you get to choose who's going to represent you and thereby you're consenting and we're doing the will of the people and all this bogus mythology that people are taught. And then they put up with being robbed and controlled and imprisoned and extorted and, and all these things. Like, well, it's the law. This is our system, yada, yada, yada. And then the slaves repeat the mythology they were taught and they reinforce it. And like, you know, what you started with was supposed to be a joke, but it's that's real. You get people to do the cult ritual. They are saying they accept the premise of the cult of government that it's legitimate and it's okay and we play this game and then we let them rule us and then they have our consent. And, you know, some of us <laughs> eventually figured out I'm not going to consent for me and I have no right to consent for anybody else. This game can't be legitimate and I'm going to stop pretending it is. I'm going to stop being one of the people who go along and act as if it's okay 
to have a giant, violent, parasitic ruling class. Um, and yes, it's a ruling class, all the garbage about representative. It's not okay for that to exist. And it's not okay for any moral human being to endorse that or advocate it or go along with it at all. And saying, well, this one's slightly less bad than that. They're both the advocacy of mass enslavement. And I'm not doing that. In the name of the roads and Social Security and the fire department, amen. <laughs> yes, it does seem like some people are so thoroughly indoctrinated that we are basically speaking Greek. And of course, as I say, the, the number one objection we're going to hear, even from people who tend to be sympathetic to our distrust and dislike for government, will be, be more practical, be more practical. So here is me being practical about this. I personally, I, I will actually say to people, if you are an American and if you feel compelled to go to the voting booth and do your little religious sacrament on Tuesday, do it. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. I, I don't think anything is fundamentally really going to change until zero people show up on Election Day. But if you're going to go do that on Tuesday, go and do it. Because I personally guarantee you, ironclad, 100% guarantee you, that your vote will not change anything. And I mean that in the dual sense, not only whichever candidate is you're, you're going to get, you're going to get, you know, people in positions of authority that doesn't exist. But I also mean that in the double sense that I guarantee you that your vote will not be the deciding vote between one or the other of these puppets. It, it will not be. It will not come down to your district or whatever you call it in America, your single vote. And if there is anyone watching this, video who ends up being in that district in which it goes one way or the other over one vote and your vote was the deciding vote i will personally come to your doorstep and eat your hat eat my hat eat a hat eat a bunch of hats because it will not happen so go ahead do your little religious sacrament it won't change a thing it won't matter at all but here's the real practical question you and i agree that voting is immoral it shouldn't be done we don't do it we don't encourage others to do it so what do we encourage others to do? What is the game plan for becoming more free? The, the game plan, first of all, it's a numbers game. It matters how many of the, the slaves on the plantation figure out that slavery is not okay. Because if almost all of them think it's okay, the best that one or two can do is run away and hide in the woods. And I don't want to settle for that. Um, despite the fact that I'm surrounded by woods right now. Um, the solution is to have people give up the superstition of authority and government and stop imagining it to be legitimate. Um, this actually ties in with the thing I was going to say about practicality. You know, the people who are like pro-freedom and, and even some anarchists are like, well, we have to vote and get what we can get and blah, 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 blah. The statistical obvious reality is that if 49% of people vote for absolute freedom, it accomplishes absolutely nothing. You don't get 49% of power, you get 0% of power. However, if 10%, it doesn't even need to be that high, if 10% of the people understand the concepts of self-ownership and non-aggression, they don't play the game and they just disobey, not even resisting, not even let's go have a revolution, just disobey, they could end any authoritarian power in the world. So choosing the path of let's go vote, where until we're 50%, it's totally worthless instead of let's just disobey. 10% of this population is 30 some million people. If one year 30 some million people said, hey, IRS, we're not giving you money anymore. There is nothing the ruling class could do about it. If 30 million people said, we're going to smoke pot, whether it's legal or not, and we might even defend ourselves when you come to cage us, there is nothing they can do about it. Alcohol prohibition fell apart. Because people just said, we don't really care that that's the law. We're going to do this anyway. And occasionally, if you send your revenuers, we're going to tar and feather them or just shoot them. When that many people just disobey, like I said, even if they don't resist, 30 million people, what are you going to do with 30 million people who just say, we're just not giving you our money. We're not giving you our allegiance. We're not playing your games. There is no empire in the world that could survive 10% of the people just not playing the game even if it was passive. And I'm not a pacifist. I'm all in favor of people defending themselves from aggressors, including aggressors with badges. You have 30 million people actively, forcibly resisting state aggression when they disobey. 
that is the end of that empire just in a heartbeat. And it shows why it's so ridiculous to play the game, the game of the tyrants for the tyrants and by the tyrants called democracy. It's a rigged game. It, they made it knowing that it's the way to keep people bashing their heads against a brick wall. And it's not even 10 percent. It's, you know, a few percent of people, if they just openly said, yeah, I don't I don't pay tribute to the ruling class. I ignore its laws. You know, I hide from them sometimes or I resist if I have to or whatever. But we have to get people to stop feeling a moral obligation to bow to a ruling class instead of like we really, really need the legislative permission of the rulers to be free. We need them to write down on paper that we're allowed to have pot or we're allowed to have a gun or we're allowed to keep our own money. We need their holy permission of these, you know, the high priests of the cult of government to be allowed to do things. No, you need for people to stop believing that we need their permission and just live like free human beings and ignore them or resist them if you have to. But a very small percentage of the population can do that Whereas 49%, if you're playing democracy, can't do anything. So to play their game, the rigged game, when it's guaranteed to do nothing, I mean, if it's 49%, even if you have 51, it still does nothing for other reasons. But it's guaranteed to do nothing if you're not a majority of the voters. And with such, so much a smaller percentage, you could end any authoritarian empire in the world without the agreement of the rest of the people. You don't even need the majority to understand. You just need a minority to say, we're just not playing anymore. Sorry. So not true. sorry. <laughs> so true. It takes such a small number of people uh, acting together um, in order to accomplish incredible things. And I always point to the, the, the sharing economy or whatever people call it these days as one of the, the examples of how people spontaneously organize and can, can accomplish incredible things and will ultimately... Well, you know, overtake and upset uh, existing rules and regulations on taxicab monopolies and what have you, and the government has to come in in its wake and try to clean up the mess, because people will spontaneously organize and can do incredible things together. That is real people power, not a bunch of people going and ticking a box. So I think it's like the Matrix. I think the first iteration of it was these individuals are actual gods and they can tell you what to do. And then that became, well, okay, they're not gods. They're the representative of God. Uh, and then it became, no, 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 okay, wait, no, the authority comes from you guys, so we'll all just take a poll and we'll go with the the majority. It, it gets more complicated, it gets more subtle, it gets more effective with each iteration of that Matrix. But I like to think there's at least one or two more Neos out there right now that see through that ridiculous system and see the, the coding behind it. Um, so in the event that that, uh, that is taking place in someone's mind right now, let's direct them to LarkinRose.com and of course to read The Most Dangerous Superstition to watch your videos like The Tiny Dot and other ones that really do elucidate this in a more uh, thorough manner. And finally, I think we should uh, put a plug in for your forthcoming project, which I'm exceptionally excited about. I've been on my at the edge of my seat for a year, two years, whatever it's been now. So uh, you're probably going to have to pay for my chiropractor bill if I went to chiropractors. Uh, tell us about your, your project that uh, we're still waiting for. It's called The Mirror. And unlike most of what I do, because most of what I do is, you know, explaining the, the rude truth and throwing it in people's faces and debating people and arguing with people. It's a completely passive, gentle way to help somebody look at their own belief system. Because like you mentioned before, and as you know, very similar to, to me, and it'll be very familiar to a lot of other people, when your own brain gets to the point of, yeah, this, this is inconsistent with myself, I can't keep doing this. Like I can't, I can't play a game that's going to legitimize the, like, my enemy when he gets into power. And when I figured out, like, I can't tell these, you know, the leftists, it's immoral for you to steal my money for a welfare state. But, you know, for me to rob yours uh, for by way of government for a police state, that's OK, because it's for your own good. And I know, wait, I'm making their exact argument. I got to sort that out. So the mirror, it, it's this it's hard to even describe because I don't even know what to compare it to. It's this there, there's a there's sort of a, a trailer thing for it on YouTube Um it's completely, it's 3D animated, so it has all these visual things, but it's interactive. It isn't just sit there and shut up while I tell you stuff. It's all about asking what that person believes, um, their view of morality and humanity and society and how things should be, and it never bothers to get judgmental or argumentative, or it 
just helps them sort out the stuff inside their own head. And it's my contention that it is impossible to be consistent inside your own head and still believe in authority and government. And I accidentally became an anarchist by figuring that out and going, I, I remove, I kept saying, all right, there's contradiction. One of them's got to go and there's contradiction. One of them's got to go. And then realizing, Ooh, what I advocate isn't government anymore. And it can't be. And so it's, it's the most gentle, non-confrontational um, way I've ever seen to do that. And taking into account a lot of human psychology where, you know, normally, even if it's a show like this, people who have a different uh, viewpoint, if they hear it immediately, they're on the defensive and they're, they're scared and they're, they're argumentative and they're naturally like, uh, I'm suspicious of something that doesn't match what I already believe. Well, this, there is no other opinion. It's just, it's just you looking in your own brain and you answering questions about what you believe. And it's not like, ah, that's wrong. It's whatever you say, that's what you believe. It isn't, it isn't about getting the right answers. It's just about, are you consistent with yourself? Because statists never are. They can't be. And when I was one, I wasn't consistent. It's impossible to be consistent. So, And it has all these visuals and, and, and sounds and, and cool stuff, which I don't need to get into here. And, and it is hard to explain. I will, of course, put the, the trailer in uh, the, the show notes for this so people can go and watch it for themselves. I'm, I'm so excited about this because I think it is probably the single best way to go about doing this. As you say, it's not getting in someone's face and shouting at them and, and being confrontational because people will all automatically retreat into their shell in that situation. So drawing people out of that and drawing out the implications of what they already believe is, yeah, it's, it's such an effective idea. So I'm very, very, very much looking forward to it. And that is key because what people really are, what they really want, what they really believe in is anarchist. And they don't know it. And they don't, you know, that term to them means violent chaos. But there, there are ways to show that this is what you, this is what is in line with you. It isn't like I'm going to, and that's the thing is I don't have to force my values on you. If you dig down deep inside and you get past the fears and the contradictions and the indoctrination, you realize this is already what you are. It's already what you want. There's just been confusion and superstition and, and, you know, a bunch of propaganda messing up your perception of things such that you don't even know what you are until you dig in there and dig into your own brain and go, yeah, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that. I want this is what I want. Peaceful coexistence. Ooh, guess what? There's a term for that. It's called <laughs> anarchy or yeah. voluntary, if you want the less scary term. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. And most, yeah, uh, most people don't even realize they already live the vast majority of their lives in anarchical relationships with others. It's just they've never even thought to put in those terms. So, again, I'm very much looking forward to this estimated time of arrival. If I even try to estimate, I'll be way off and it'll be a million years later. Um, I'm making lots of progress and I love it. The, 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 I've said this before. The challenge is that the, the finish line keeps running away because I keep going, oh, I should also add, oh, and I should do with it. And I think I'm to the point now where I'm starting to gain on the finish line, like accomplish more than the new stuff I'm thinking up that should be in there. Um, it's still many months away, um, but I... But once it's done, it's free for everybody. It's just going to get thrown out there, and it'll be a different experience for everybody because it's interactive, which mean, which makes it a massive undertaking to make it. It's, you know, if you're going to make an hour of video, you're making an hour of material. If you're going to make an hour of interactive stuff that, that where it goes depends on how the person answers, you're making 10, 20, 50 hours of stuff that can ad adapt to whatever they answer. So it's, it's a ridiculously huge undertaking but it's it was only like a couple of years ago where i realized that would actually be possible after thinking i can't be done because i'm thinking you know one-on-one -on -one conversations up till now is the best i could do but you know the, in the time it took to have a nice conversation with somebody how many hundreds of statists were just born like uh, statistically this really isn't going to work we need a, a a replicatable replicable whatever the word is supposed to be a way to do this with a bunch of people simultaneously doing the interactive process. And so it's, it's not quite artificial intelligence, but it's sort of, it takes the place of a, a passive understanding conversation with the individual to bring out what they really want and what's really in line with their values and their moral code and their view of humanity. And to show them this is already what you should want and what you, what you do want.
deep down inside. So, so maybe this really is the last election America will ever see, because by the time the next one rolls around, everyone will be switched on through the mirror. So there you go. <laughs> I hope. All right. So what's the best way for people to support you and your work? Um, let's see. I do a horrible job of self-promotion. I do have a Patreon account. Um, I should give you a link to that. I've done a horrible job of pointing out that I have one of them. I didn't um, even know till just now, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> See how bad I am at that? I got to get better at that. Um, because, because you know, it's not an investment sort of thing because I'm giving it away to the world when it's done after all this. Um, so I, I rely on, and there are, you know, a bunch of people have given me a little bit and some people have given me a bunch to make sure I can spend, you know, full time working on this thing that'll, you know, with zero profit potential to it because it's just a giveaway when it's done. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll give you the link to Patreon and then, and people can make direct donations if they want. And I just plug away at it, you know, and all the, all the time I can find uh, the cool thing is I don't, um, it's pretty dang cost effective because I, I have the animation program myself. I do it myself. I know how to do that. Professional animators, like 12 gajillion dollars an hour. So that would just doom the project, but I happen to know how to do it already. Um, and I, do music production so I can do that, the animation, the script writing, the, the most of it I already know how to do and, the, and already have the equipment. So it's not like, well, I need $12 million to buy. It's just a matter of time, which is just a matter of me not having to do other stuff to pay the bills. Um, so it's, it'll probably be the most cost-effective animation project in history. Um, instead of in the millions, it'll be yeah. in the thousands. Well, exactly right. Okay, and let's not forget you also sell books, so we'll uh, exhort yeah. people to read a few of your, your tomes. All right, I think we'll leave it there for today. Uh, again, people who are interested um, can check out LarkinRose.com, check out your Facebook, uh, check out the various other resources that will be linked in the show notes. Uh, Larkin, thank you for setting the record straight, unless you have anything else to add. Sorry, I have to throw this in. When it comes to elections, the, the video I most suggest is the Jones Plantation. Anybody thinking of voting, go watch that, and then you'll be too sick to vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. And, of course, that'll be in the show notes, too. All right, Larkin, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber, a weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.